deadlier than ever. Someone may use it as a biological weapon. God help us if they do. There wasn't a country in the world that had not been touched and devastated by smallpox. But in the most massive undertaking ever to rid humanity of a disease, smallpox was conquered. It took a 12-year campaign to vaccinate the world. Officially, only a few vials of the live virus remain, and there is a raging debate about what to do with them. Join us for Smallpox, Deadly Again. Atlanta, Georgia. In the middle of this bustling city of three and a half million people sits an ordinary looking complex of government buildings, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Behind these closed doors, scientists work in high security labs with some of the world's deadliest biological agents, Ebola, Anthrax, Marburg. They are all lethal. Only one among them, however, has already massacred millions. Its name is smallpox. Today, specimens of the deadly virus, also known as variola, sleep in a nondescript freezer under the ultimate security precautions. The virus is frozen in liquid uh, nitrogen, and not many people even know uh, exactly where physically uh, the rooms are where uh, the virus is being uh, held. Viruses are among the smallest of all life forms. These single-celled parasites invade a host cell and hijack its DNA in order to replicate themselves. Among all known viruses, smallpox is the largest, containing the most complex DNA sequence. It is also one of the smartest. It is designed for one thing, which is to kill. It generally enters through the nose and attacks the cells in the lungs. The virus expands in the cell. Then the next cell over, which touches the first cell, will catch it, and it goes on from there. In a matter of hours, it can spread all over the body. It's one of the fastest and most efficient killers of them all. Unlocking the mysteries of how viruses operate are modern discoveries, but smallpox is an ancient menace. This microscopic life form has been terrorizing mankind since the beginning of civilization. No one knows when smallpox makes its first appearance on the stage of human history. Most likely, it begins as an animal virus somewhere in Africa, the Middle East, or the Asian subcontinent. At some point, the virus makes the jump to the human population. We estimate we'd have to have hundreds of thousands of people before it could keep going. So we assume the spread to the human population did not occur until after the first agricultural settlements, maybe 10,000 years ago. The smallpox virus follows the population as it migrates. It spreads slowly throughout burgeoning human communities. The first tangible evidence of its deadly nature is found in the ruins of ancient Egypt. In 1898, an archeologist uncovers the mummy of Pharaoh Ramses V, believed to have died around 1157 BC. That mummy has a rash, the distribution of which and the size of the pustules match uh, almost exactly that of smallpox in more, uh, more recent times. And so we think that is the first concrete evidence of the smallpox virus in humans. Vague descriptions of the virus appear in some early chronicles. In 430 BC, Greek historian Thucydides writes of a lethal pox-like illness that decimates the great city-state of Athens, causing the end of the Peloponnesian War. 165 AD, Roman centurions returning from Mesopotamia carry another pox-like illness to their capital city. The plague of Antonius rages for 15 years and kills an estimated three and a half to seven million people. The first full written record of a smallpox case is provided by a 9th century Persian physician, Razis. He describes a gruesome pathology that begins with a rash covering the body, then days later breaks out into tiny pus-filled pox. Blindness may result if the eyes are affected. If a patient is lucky, he is scarred for life. If not, he dies. This virus killed people by destroying internal systems. We could see what it was doing to the outside of the, the body, the skin. 
But in fact, the same thing was happening to the intestines, to the linings of uh, the lungs, and those kind of vital organs. So you'd have uh, the lining sloughing off, and uh, people simply uh, drowning, for example, in their own internal fluids. Early treatments for the virus variola, Latin for speckled, are varied and uniformly uncomfortable. The physician Razis recommends that victims should be bled to the point of fainting. Other therapies include opening the sores on the seventh day with a golden needle or drinking a potion of horse dung. Possibly the most torturous treatment involves the application of heat even though smallpox involves a high fever. And they put you next to a fire and they close all the windows. So you take a person who was deathly ill and made him feel much worse. That uh, heat somehow came to be associated with the color red, so that smallpox victims were put in rooms that were painted entirely red, that had red draperies. They were made to wear red pajamas. They were wrapped in red blankets. They sometimes were made to drink red juices all with the understanding that uh, this color red would draw the infection out uh, more rapidly. It's hard to know, but a certain percentage, and probably a substantial percentage, of smallpox patients died because of the doctors, not because of the disease. As trade routes open up between Europe and Asia, merchants travel the Silk Road to China, unaware that they are also exporting the mortal ailment. Crusaders returning from West Asia in the 12th and 13th centuries carry the disease back home to their families, ignorant of the fact that even those not afflicted with full symptoms are spreading the virus. As soon as people came to begin feeling ill with headache, backache, those kinds of symptoms, they were already breathing out virus onto others. Other killer diseases, such as bubonic plague or yellow fever, sweep through populations periodically. But by the 15th century, smallpox is endemic in much of the old world, continually spreading throughout the population. Most people who reach adulthood have already survived the infection. In fact, most of the paintings you see of the great beauties of the time, the painters were faking it, because these people, particularly the women, had truly awful complexions. But people just saw through it. They simply ignored the pox because everybody had it. October 1562. The 29-year-old Protestant Queen of England, Elizabeth I, catches a chill while walking in the gardens of Hampton Court. A German physician diagnoses her ailment as smallpox, sending the Queen into a rage. Have the knave away, out of my sight. The Queen's anger cannot prevent the inevitable. A telltale rash soon appears with its accompanying high fever. England is in turmoil. If Elizabeth dies without an heir, Mary, Queen of Scots, may seize the throne, bringing Catholics back into power. Queen Elizabeth was wrapped in crimson cloth and put near a fire. They closed all the windows and they made her as absolutely miserable as possible. Despite the best efforts of her physicians, she survived. There are many historians who think that she lost most of her hair, one of the reasons why she wore a red wig for the rest of her life. And they're not quite sure what it did to her complexion, but quite likely it was a mess. It was one of the reasons she wore very, very thick makeup. In the years following her illness, the young queen squelches the Catholic threat and ultimately executes her cousin Mary. Elizabeth's reign lasts 45 years, becoming one of the most dynamic eras of the British Empire. This was one of the great uh, might have beens of, of history. If she had died in her 20s as she was then, uh, certainly English and probably world history would have been very different. Other English monarchs are not so fortunate when smallpox strikes their thrones. Over 130 years later, William III and Mary II rule as co-sovereigns. William is known to have entertained at least one mistress. Yet when his wife becomes ill with the pox in the days before Christmas 1694, grief overwhelms the king, as recorded by the Bishop of Salisbury. He cried out that there was no hope, and that from being the happiest, he was now going to be the miserablest creature on earth. He was said to be inconsolable. 
William III uh, spent the uh, duration of his wife's uh, illness at her bedside and uh, really uh, witnessed her slipping away, horribly disfigured by this terrible disease. Eight days after the onset of her symptoms, tolling bells announced the Queen's death to a heartsick England. William has already lost both his father and mother to smallpox. Now he is alone once more. He never married again and was uh, a very sad man for the rest of his life. Not all the deaths by smallpox yield such dire results. When a young Manchu emperor of China dies of the pox in 1661 AD, court advisors ignore the time-honored rules of succession. The powers that be then selected, not the oldest son, as which would have been natural, but they skipped to the third youngest son because that child was the one who had already had smallpox. And that boy grew up to become one of the two or three greatest emperors of China, Kangxi. He ruled for more than 30 years and was a very, very wise man. The virus spares no royal family. During a single 120-year period beginning in 1654, Smallpox kills eight ruling monarchs, including King Louis XV of France, King Louis I of Spain, and Tsar Peter II of Russia. We cannot know uh, what those uh, monarchs would have done had they lived, but we can know that they would have done things differently than uh, their successors did. By striking at the very core of power, the variola virus indisputably helps shape the course of world history. However, it is during the early 16th century that the gods of smallpox begin to wreak human destruction on an unimaginable scale. By 1520, the Spanish have already settled the Caribbean islands when Hernando Cortes occupies the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan in Mexico. He hopes to capture new slaves and a bounty of gold. The Aztecs are a highly militarized society and eventually drive the Spaniard and his small army from the city. It was a major, major defeat. The Aztecs essentially drove Cortes out of town, but one of the soldiers retreating had smallpox. The Native Americans had absolutely no immunity to most European diseases, smallpox most of all. Cortes reorganizes his troops and months later heads back to re-engage the Aztec warriors. But this time, he encounters little resistance. The virus has done most of his work for him. Bodies line the streets of Tenochtitlan. A vast proportion of the Aztec population is dead. It seems that the Indians were unusually susceptible to the disease. Death rates of 70 to 90 percent were common. And this was true all the way down through the Andean region. Smallpox spreads down through the Central American Peninsula and into South America, terrorizing the natives with its relentless death toll and ghastly skin eruptions. The fact that this virus appeared at about the same time as the, as the Spanish gave it that much more of a psychological uh, uh, impact so that we felt that these people had magic powers, that they were uh, escaping this infection that was devastating all of the Native American populations. In 1532, Spanish conqueror Francisco Pizarro finds the ancient civilization of the Incas in chaos and its leaders dead. Some historians estimate that the smallpox virus has reduced the population of Peru to one-fourth of its original size. So essentially it wasn't the Spanish army that conquered the Native Americans, it was smallpox. The smallpox virus also appears in North America around the same time as Europeans seek to conquer and colonize the new land. The pilgrims record the fact that um, God saw fit to come amongst the native people and take away great numbers of them to make room for us. Well, actually, there'd been a massive smallpox epidemic in the preceding two years. As in Central and South America, the virus spreads like wildfire as the colonial borders push westward into new frontiers. In 1763, colonial British officers stationed near Fort Pitt, Pennsylvania, face a confrontation with local natives. 
Sir Geoffrey Amherst, Commander-in-Chief of the British Forces in America, suggests a new weapon to battle the contentious Indians in a letter to another colonel. Could it not be contrived to send the smallpox among these disaffected tribes of Indians? We must on this occasion use every stratagem in our power to reduce them. Shortly afterwards, a British officer writes in his journal that the plan is in motion. We gave them two blankets and a handkerchief out of the smallpox hospital. I hope it will have the desired effect. No official documents record the success of this operation. However, in the ensuing months, hundreds of Mingo, Delaware, and Shawnee Native Americans die. This is quite possibly the first ever use of a biological weapon. In 1709, the virus reaches the Pacific Ocean, infecting Native Americans in California's missions. In the course of just under 200 years, smallpox has reduced these once robust nations to a fraction of their original population. By the 18th century, there is hardly a country that is spared from the terror of smallpox. It kills up to 30% of those it afflicts, those who survive are branded for life. Smallpox was a river that everyone had to cross one way or another. People lived with the understanding that they would have smallpox almost certainly during their lifetimes. They would either die prematurely from it uh, or not. Some observers note that if a person survives smallpox, he retains immunity throughout his life. This leads to one of the first measures aimed at mitigating the virus's deadly toll. In Turkey in 1717, an intrepid Englishwoman, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, witnesses a strange procedure which the Turks use to induce a mild case of smallpox before a major case can strike. Specifically, they found that if you took pustular material from a patient who had the active disease, and you put it on the skin and then sort of scratched it in, the patient would not be that sick normally. No one knows exactly when or where this practice, called variolation or inoculation, first appeared. It results in death in up to 2% of patients, but people fear smallpox so greatly that many willingly assume the risk. Called buying the pox, Various styles of inoculation are practiced in parts of Africa, India, and China. Now Lady Mary Wortley Montague decides to bring the procedure to England. But here she meets resistance to this unprecedented medical procedure. Everybody understood that this was a very dangerous virus, and while I might understand that putting it into the skin was less dangerous than people breathing it naturally, it was difficult for lay people and even some other physicians to understand that. Lady Montague's friend, the Princess of Wales, seeks better proof of the strange procedure's safety and asks six condemned prisoners facing the gallows to be variolated. If they die, smallpox will be the executioner. If they live, they will be spared the noose and set free. Five of them came down with minor cases of smallpox and survived. The sixth came down with nothing. He was probably immune, and they let him go. So she went to an orphanage. Notice you the royalty would pick on the people who were least capable of helping themselves, and had a bunch of orphans variolated, and none of them died. She then decided maybe it was safe and had her family variolated. Gradually, with this royal stamp of approval, the practice of inoculation spreads throughout England. But variolation causes controversy again in the American colonies. Boston, 1721. Graveyards fill with fresh victims as a smallpox epidemic grips the port city. But the great Puritan preacher, Cotton Mather, has learned that one of his African slaves doesn't fear the disease. The slave allowed us how uh, he wasn't in danger of getting smallpox because he had been inoculated before. And in that way, Cotton Mather came to first hear of this practice. He then put it into practice, having one of his children inoculated as evidence of how this could be done. This deliberate attempt to infect someone with the heinous pox outrages the anxious Bostonians. 
The doctor who performed the inoculation, Zabdil Boylston, allegedly hides in his home for two weeks after threats are made against his life. Someone tosses a crude grenade into Reverend Mather's house with a note attached. Cotton Mather, you dog. Damn you. I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox to you. The epidemic of 1722 proves the last major outbreak of smallpox in Boston as its citizens finally accept inoculation. In other places around the world, the practice of variolation begins to ease the death rates of smallpox. Also, for the first time, physicians know enough to count precisely the days between exposure to the disease and the onset of symptoms. They now realize that there is a 10 to 12 day incubation period when someone seems well, but is in an infectious stage, a danger to others. Physicians and governments begin to use isolation as a means of containing the spread of the disease. We would take smallpox patients and put them in ships in the harbor and not let anybody come or go. There were pest houses, which were hospitals that flew special flags that tell you to stay away from it, and that's where they put the smallpox patients. Other innovations improved the care of smallpox patients. During the late 17th century, English physician Thomas Sydenham bans the heat treatment, ordering patients to move about as much as possible. When in bed, windows are opened to let in fresh air. Light bed sheets replace red blankets. Still, there is no cure for smallpox. Once a patient is sick, there is nothing to do but wait it out. By the late 18th century, smallpox is at its most destructive in Europe, killing hundreds of thousands each year. 1778, Gloucestershire, England. A smallpox epidemic rages throughout the British countryside. Like many in rural areas, a local doctor, Edward Jenner, is aware of folk wisdom, noting that dairy maids working on his farm could nurse smallpox victims with no fear of contagion. Milkmaids would catch cowpox, which is a related disease, sort of a first cousin to smallpox, and they would get mildly ill. They would break out in sores, usually on their hands, and then they would be fine. Milkmaids never got smallpox. For some reason or other, getting cowpox gave them immunity. After studying cowpox infections for 18 years, Jenner finally prepares to prove a hunch. On May 14, 1796, he takes pus from the hand of a milkmaid infected with cowpox and inoculates an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps. After Phipps recovers from a mild case of the bovine disease, Jenner inoculates him with the actual and potentially lethal smallpox virus. As expected, the smallpox infection never takes hold. The doctor publishes his results, naming the new technique vaccination after vaca, the Latin word for cow. Jenner gains acclaim as discoverer of the world's first vaccine. He is known today as the father of modern immunology. It was a major medical achievement. It was a new way of looking at prevention of disease. It is true, however, that Jenner had no idea what he was doing. It seemed to him logical that it would work, and it worked, but he had no clue why it worked. Many ridicule the new vaccine, but most submit to the cowpox inoculations when new epidemics of smallpox break out. Soon, the world is clamoring for the new smallpox vaccine. Would-be vaccinators in Spain design innovative methods to keep the vaccine alive during transport to the new world. They would take a group of orphans and put them on the boat. They would inoculate the first one with the virus, and after a pustule would form on the arm, they would take material from that orphan and inoculate the next one and the next one. Eventually, when they got to the new world, let's say, then the orphans would be uh, then given over to families living there. And uh, that's the way they got the vaccine from place to place. At last, physicians begin to make inroads against the deadly disease that has ravaged millions for almost 3,000 years. Mortality figures drop worldwide. However, vaccination rates vary from country to country 
and few people realize that the vaccine does not confer lifetime immunity. Much of the population remains at risk. Even President Abraham Lincoln falls ill with the pox just hours after completing the Gettysburg Address on November 19, 1863. Fortunately, it is not a severe case. As he recovers, the president finds humor in his illness amid the cantankerous politics of Washington. President Lincoln is said to have said to one of his uh, associates that uh, there was one good thing about Lincoln's infection, and that was that Lincoln now had something that he could give to everyone. Lincoln survives with few visible scars, but as the 19th century draws to a close, the same can't be said for the world at large. The scourge of smallpox has exterminated hundreds of millions of lives, and its wrath still threatens many people all over the planet. In the early 20th century, vaccination combined with isolation of smallpox patients stems the tide of infection in most industrialized nations. With the threat diminishing, Americans aren't being vaccinated, leaving them susceptible to infection. In March of 1947, an American businessman returns from Mexico infected with the variola virus and dies in a New York hospital. By mid-April, 12 more cases are reported, causing a panic. They wound up vaccinating essentially everybody in New York City, six million people, and they did it in matters of days. At uh, one time, uh, half a million people were vaccinated in one day, which is still believed to be the world's record. This frightening incident underscores the sad truth. As long as smallpox exists somewhere in the world, the terror will not diminish. In 1953, the Director General of the newly formed World Health Organization, an arm of the United Nations, suggests a solution to the smallpox crisis. His plan? To eradicate it from the human race. Almost two decades pass before the Soviet Union and the United States reach across the battle lines of the Cold War and join forces to fund an eradication effort. Dr. D.A. Henderson of the CDC heads the campaign. There are five main areas where the virus remains endemic. In order to stop the disease, health workers will have to interrupt permanently the chain of transmission. It will be the first time anyone has attempted such a daunting task. Brazilian physician Dr. Ciro de Quadros joins the effort in his country. We had many species that have been extinguished by pollution. So the smallpox uh, was the first species in that uh, mankind made a deliberate attempt to extinguish. The first battle in this historic campaign starts in Western Africa in 1967. Dr. Donald Hopkins is part of an army of local health workers and international volunteers who set out equipped only with jet injectors and freeze-dried vaccine. For many, it is their first real look at the ancient disease. All of us young people were really uh, geared up to go get smallpox. And it was impressive, even shocking, to see the disease uh, face to face. You could see, in a sense, how much they hurt in a way that could not be conveyed by, uh, by pictures. I remember only too vividly visiting uh, a smallpox ward in Dhaka in Bangladesh with a British physician who'd seen a lot of tropical disease in Africa. And this physician sort of put his hands on the banister outside and he said, this is the most horrible disease that was ever created. And this guy would seen everything. The first plan of attack is mass vaccination. When the program runs short of vaccine in southeast Nigeria, a different approach is tried. They had to set priorities for using the little vaccine they had. They focused on the currently infected households and villages and were able to demonstrate that, lo and behold, by vaccinating only the smaller number of people, uh, they were able to stop the uh, infection from spreading. This technique, known as surveillance and containment, becomes the main plan of attack. 
The strategy is to find a case of smallpox, isolate the patient, and vaccinate everyone within a ring around the location. Then the ring is extended, and they vaccinate an even wider circle of possible contacts, thus containing the infection. For this to succeed 100%, healthcare workers will have to track down every single case of smallpox on the planet. There were uh, tremendous logistical hurdles in simply getting uh, to places. Many of these places had no roads. You had to walk into them, uh, ford uh, streams. Wild animals, I have to say, were not generally a threat, though I personally worried about, uh, about snakes a lot. For the most part, villagers eagerly line up to be vaccinated, although some health workers meet with resistance. You would try to convince the chief of the, of the village, the priest, and they would reluctantly accept. And what is worse, sometimes they would become even hostile. They would, for instance, you would come to the village and suddenly you are chased by dogs, you are chased by stones, you are chased by spears, you are chased by guns. Flashcards depicting infected babies are shown to villagers. School children lead the workers to housebound patients. When I began with the smallpox program, and there were many people very pessimistic telling me you couldn't do it. Surprisingly, we got along about two, three years into the program, and it was going so much better than we'd ever imagined. I mean, the, the, the disease was disappearing. By 1971, the last case is isolated in Latin America. The American continents are free of the virus for the first time since the conquistadors arrived. Soon, Indonesia and Southern Africa claim success as well. I began to think, you know, we could really do this. We might get there. And then we hit South Asia. In India, Hindus pray to the goddess Shitala Mata when smallpox strikes. Epidemics are so horrible in this country of 600 million that dead bodies clog the rivers. You'd contain an outbreak here, and you'd go a little further, and you'd find another half dozen villages that were infected. You didn't even know where to begin. There was so much to do. In 1973, India and WHO launch a desperate plan. They mobilize an unprecedented army of health workers to visit each and every home in the country to document any cases of smallpox. The workers have 10 days to conduct the search, then vaccination teams follow. Amazingly, this strategy succeeds. 120,000 health workers went out and in 10 days visited every house in India. Unbelievable. It took eight tons of paper <laughs> just to do the, the book work on this. With reporting accuracy near 100%, it becomes clear that there is far more smallpox than originally believed. But workers successfully vaccinate the rings of population around the pockets of infection. Shatala Mata, goddess of smallpox, begins to lose her power. The last cases occurred a little more than 18 months later, and it was gone from India. Uh, the Indian government couldn't believe it, and frankly, we couldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, probably for the first time in recorded history, there was no smallpox in India. Following the WHO's heroic campaign, the virus survives in two remaining areas, Bangladesh and Eastern Africa. Despite civil wars in both countries, the search and containment method again prevails. By 1977, WHO officials believe they have contained the virus in these regions as well. Somalian Ali Mao Malin now holds a dubious distinction. In 1977, he becomes the last human to contract smallpox from a natural infection. For two years, officials wait for another case to surface, but none does. Finally, on May 8, 1980, after the virus has killed at least 300 million people in the 20th century alone, the World Health Organization declares the world free of smallpox. It recommends that all countries cease vaccinations. It is no longer necessary. The eradication of smallpox was uh, really an unprecedented uh, human uh, achievement. This was the first time that we had uh, broken forever 
the change of transmission of any disease. The fact that it happened with the virus that had caused so much havoc among humans made it that much more momentous. With the historic eradication of smallpox in the 1970s, vaccination for the disease stops. It is no longer a threat. The virus does not exist in the wild. The World Health Organization calls for laboratories around the world to destroy their samples of the virus or to transfer them to one of two official repositories in Moscow or the Atlanta facilities of the Centers for Disease Control. WHO plans to finish off its successful eradication program by destroying these remaining vials of the virus sometime in June 1999. But in early 1992, a former high-level military doctor from the Soviet Union, now calling himself Ken Alibek, defects to America. He brings with him unsettling insider information about a massive biological warfare operation in Russia, first established in 1928. By the late 80s, uh, this program was so huge, very sophisticated, very powerful, uh, with about 60, 70,000 people. Uh, dozens of uh, institutes, research and development facilities, and production, manufacturing facilities, including smallpox. In his book, Biohazard, Dr. Alibek reveals the Soviet military's decision to increase its work with the smallpox virus at the same time as WHO is winning its war against the disease. At one point, the Soviet factories produced 20 tons of the virus to be dispersed to its enemies by means of specially designed warheads. Dr. Alibek's revelations were uh, earth-shattering. There was a strong suspicion, more than a suspicion, that the Russians had been involved in some sort of operations with regard to biological weapons. But the, what he described, the extent, the complexity, the investment, the fact that it was still present, I can say that this was a bombshell. Smallpox could indeed prove a powerful and deadly weapon. Not only does it guarantee a death rate of about 30% on an unvaccinated population, but unlike other potential biological weapons, it is highly contagious. Even those who were inoculated before vaccination stopped in the late 1970s are vulnerable. The vaccine doesn't provide lifetime immunity. Everybody, practically everybody is vulnerable to this virus. Even a single person infected with uh, this virus uh, could infect uh, tens or even hundreds of new people. By early 1999, revelations such as these raise enough concern that President Clinton delays the scheduled destruction of the virus in the CDC repository. This sparks an argument that still divides the scientific community today. Some researchers believe the actual virus will one day be our best weapon against the disease. They hope to use the virus to create a powerful new antiviral agent. I personally do not think that we should destroy the, the smallpox virus. To destroy the virus completely now says that uh, we are certain that nobody is ever going to have a, a use for this, and to do so, I think, is arrogant. Others point out that it is the supplies of the smallpox vaccine that are critical. Production of vaccines stopped over 25 years ago, creating another chilling scenario. If anybody attacks us with smallpox, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. There's not enough vaccine for 260 million Americans. You can't make it fast enough to vaccinate everybody. I'm more than disappointed that we didn't destroy the smallpox virus. I'm deeply concerned that uh, probably the greatest threat that we have uh, in bioterrorism is use of the smallpox virus. And it seems to me that anything we could possibly do to diminish that threat, we should be doing. Completing the circle of history, we are back where we began. Even if our government stocks huge quantities of vaccine, as many experts recommend, we will live in terror of smallpox as long as it exists on Earth. I do hope uh, that eventually the virus will be uh, totally destroyed, and, uh, and I hope that this will be my lifetime. <laughs> 
Despite this new climate of fear, the smallpox eradication campaign stands as an example of how nations can work together for the common good. Many of the smallpox eradication team members have moved on to apply their knowledge to the fight against other diseases. Similar programs aim to eradicate measles, the guinea worm, and polio by the early 21st century. Those people who fought the disease were doing something for the good of humanity. They were underpaid, they were overworked, it was dangerous. There is no achievement in the history of medicine that comes even close to what these people did. I don't have very many heroes in my life, but they're my heroes. The World Health Organization has delayed its destruction of the last known vials of the virus, while the world's medical and military leaders continue to debate the issue. At this time, neither the Russians nor the Americans seem willing to destroy this potentially devastating weapon. To discover more about this and other History's Mysteries topics, please visit our website at historychannel.com.